All right, welcome back to the Naval News segment. Today we're beginning with a story that's breaking as we're recording this. An F-35 has crashed uh, on the carrier HMS Queen Elizabeth and crashed into the sea. Uh, the incident happened in the Mediterranean and is the first F-35 lost of any kind during carrier operations. So let's find out what happened here. Written by Thomas Nudick, uh, writing for The War Zone. He says, the UK Minister of Defense has confirmed that an F-35 Bravo Lightning stealth jet was operating with the Royal Navy's flagship, the aircraft carrier HMS Queen Elizabeth, currently underway in the Mediterranean. Crashed into the sea earlier today. Details are limited, but the British pilot was able to eject safely and has been returned to the ship. The aircraft carrier is on its maiden operational cruise and is the first loss of the Joint Strike Fighter while operating from the deck of an aircraft carrier, an amphibious assault ship. You know, I, I'm not surprised. I mean, landing on, you know, these ships as they're moving is, I, I would say, arguably more difficult for the uh, vertical aircraft than it is for like the F-18 that uses the capture system. You know, because they have to like maintain the same headway as the ship at the same speed and then, you know, land vertically. That takes a lot more coordination, I would think, than just a, a traditional capture from a, 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 an aircraft carrier. So back to the story, though, he says the F-35B crashed during routine flying operations at approximately 10 a.m. See, I don't know why I immediately went to... Uh, landing maybe he wasn't landing it says here it was during routine flying operations i suppose that could include landing but maybe not so let's not assume that like i just did okay uh uk time this morning no other aircraft were involved in the mishap uh the uk ministry of defense has offered no additional details about the circumstances of the incident and an investigation is underway well, at least the pilot's okay and back on board. That's the most important thing. It's a shame we lost a very expensive airplane. Uh, we'll just build another one, I guess. But it's, it'll be interesting to see what happened. I mean, was there a mechanical failure? That's kind of the first thing. If it's not an error in landing, which I would immediately jump to pilot error, uh, but if he's out doing normal flight operations, could have been a mechanical failure uh, just as much as anything else. Uh, back to the piece, it says HMS Queen Elizabeth is back in the Mediterranean, having just recently transited through the Suez Canal after having sailed to the Asian Pacific with carrier strike group 21. Yeah, this has been a very long deployment for her. Oops. Oh. Okay. Here we go. Uh oh, stop moving. Okay. <laughs> Let's scroll down here. Oh, that's her going through the Suez Canal or getting ready to, it looks like, uh, Prior to this mishap, the carrier had a contingent of eight F-35Bs, I guess now it's down to seven, of the dam busters on board. Uh, these are embarked alongside 10 similar jets of the U.S. Marine Corps. Oh, cool. So they have um, they had a total of 18. As well as the HMS Queen Elizabeth, the Royal Navy Elements CSG-21 consisted of the Type 45 destroyers, uh, which was Diamond and Defender, and a Type 23 uh, frigate, the Kent and Richmond. The Type 23 frigate is a great ASW frigate. And the Type 45 destroyer, I'm told, is a very beefy uh, air defense destroyer. So those are very powerful fleet there. It's a shame they lost the, the plane, though. Yeah. So whenever more details come out, we'll, uh, we'll definitely revisit this story, just because I'm curious to see what happened. Um, but as Thomas goes back into the history of the program, he points out that this is only the fifth crash of the F-35 of all versions. Crash totals prior to this were two U.S. Marine Corps, which reported uh, on in previous pieces. The tally does not include incidents of uh, engine fires on the ground, okay, and undercarriage failings. Okay. Yeah, very interesting. What do you guys think about this? I mean, yeah, we lost a uh, multi. Are these billion-dollar planes or million-dollar planes? I don't know. I'm sure they're not cheap. John Bloor says, you think various country subs are rushing to the crash site? Good point. Um, Turkey has some good underwater uh, retrieval systems and Russia certainly does. Ironically, Russia was just in the Mediterranean a month ago or maybe two months now. Yeah, back in September. They were in the Mediterranean with uh, underwater surveillance equipment. But as I understand it right now, they're back in St. Petersburg. But uh, that is a great point. We got to get the parts off this thing. I'm sure whatever he ejected, that automatically fried a lot of crypto. Um, but you still want to get as much as you can back. So I wouldn't be surprised if Navy's including our own, 
try to go down there with deep submergence vehicles and uh, pick up whatever pieces we can get. Great point. It's worth about 100 million British pounds. And that's a lot more than the dollar. So yeah, really expensive. Urban DK says, so what you're saying is there's there's a free F-35 in the Mediterranean. Yeah, that's pretty much what John was saying too. I'm sure it's in pieces, but the pieces are down there. Yeah. Ninja Cheeto says, I've read another article said the salvage ops will be performed if able. Yeah, of course. I mean, and it's not to try and save the plane. It's to keep other people from getting the engineering technology in, in, in this plane. And that's something I'm sure a lot of countries would be interested in. Anyway, interesting story. Let's uh, move on to the next one, though. This one here. Uh oh, oh, no. We're all zoomed in here. Here we go. Oh, reset. That's this is fine. So here's an artist rendition of a uh, anti-ship ballistic missile going down on the uh, Chinese mobile targets in the desert. There's painting by H.I. Um, Sutton. Crap. I don't know why it's so big on my screen. There we go. Pretty cool, cool little drawing. He does a lot of his art in um, MS Paint. <laughs> I don't know if that is or not, but he is an artist. All right, so let's read what H.I. Sutton has to say about China's new carrier killer. He writes, China has built a series of large-scale ship targets in the desert, including U.S. Navy aircraft carriers. Testing in the desert has some advantages compared to sea-based targets. A takeaway is that China is serious about testing its carrier killing capability. So aircraft carrier killer, uh, what anti-ship ballistic missiles are and who has them. So yeah, it's not just China, but China is the one that is uh, the most belligerent of the countries that have them. They talk about them a lot. They test them a lot. Uh, they show them off in parades a lot, you know. So H.I. Sutton writes, earlier this month, it was revealed that China had been building targets in the shape of U.S. Navy aircraft carriers in the remote deserts, together with other targets designed to represent American warships. They are believed to be part of a Chinese Navy anti-ship ballistic missile, ASBM, program. This will provide China with a potentially game-changing capability. It could inhibit other countries' ability or willingness to employ aircraft carriers against them, or certainly limit the way that they are employed, and thus the tactical and strategic impact on them. Uh, China is not the only country working with anti-ship ballistic missiles. Other countries facing a resurgence of aircraft carriers are developing similar missiles. Yeah, so if you can't build your own aircraft carrier, you can at least take some money and try and research an anti-ship ballistic missile to keep the other person from using his aircraft carrier. China's doing both. They're building aircraft carriers and have this capability because they are serious about being dominant in their region at, at the very least. You know, it's a long way to go to become more dominant than the United States military is on a global scale, but they're certainly going to be dominant in their region. Uh, that's their stated goal and they're well on the way of doing it. We're watching it happen. So, Skipping down a little bit, H.I. Uh, Sutton writes, what, uh, why they are needed. In a modern world, ships can hit, be hit by missiles or torpedoes, bombs, mines, lipid mines, even artillery fire, but those are all much more limited. However, regular missiles and torpedoes have problems, especially with large and well-defended targets. Uh, the aircraft carriers are the ultimate combination of being a large target and being well-defended. That's a good point, because it's not just the uh, aircraft carrier defending itself, it's surrounded by a fleet of ships defending it, and the aircraft on the carrier can defend it. So there's multiple layers of defense before you even get to the aircraft carrier. And uh, cyber is one of those layers. So this is not just all about weapons. Uh, electronic warfare is a large part of modern naval combat. Uh, modern heavyweight torpedoes explode beneath the keel, he says, and break the back of the ship by breaking the keel. Uh, it's even it's impressive and devastating and likely to be enough to put a carrier out of the fight if it doesn't sink it outright. Absolutely. But uh, torpedoes are relatively short range compared to missiles, especially anti-ship ballistic missiles that can go, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of miles. Uh, let's see, the high speed is also available as it reduces flight time, meaning that the target uh, will have to move less during the fight. Uh, Blake Herzinger, uh, who has written a book on China's anti-ship ballistic missiles. I wonder if that's a link. Let's just t check out this book here called Carrier Killer. Ooh. How do I buy this? Sorry for the tangent. I want this book. 
Okay. I'll come back to that. I'm going to buy that book. Okay. Uh, see, anti-ship ballistic missiles around the world. So China's got them. Who else has them? Uh, let's see if they talk about anybody else here. Obviously, Russia has them. Here we go. Uh, I, Another country going to the air launch anti-ship ballistic missile is Russia with the MiG-31 Foxhound fighters uh, carrying the KH-47M2 Tsar, no, Kinzhal's hypersonic missile. That's a different hypersonic missile than the Zircon. Okay. And this uh, Mach-10 missile has a reported range of 1,100 miles. Wow. So the Russians have a very capable air-launched anti-ship ballistic missile. That's really cool because uh, China's trying to get their H-6 strategic bomber to carry this DF-21, a modified DF-21, to be to become air-launched. I think, I think it's like, it's got a different name, doesn't it? Okay, anyway, it's a modified DF-21. Uh, I guess they haven't demonstrated the ability to actually do it, but they're trying to strap it to the bot bottom of that of that bomber, the H-6. Uh, so who else has it? India. That's the other country. There we go. India has the uh, Don Ush ballistic missile, if I'm saying that right. It's reported to have anti-ship capability as well, but a range of less than 200 nautical miles. It's just uh, ballistic in trajectory, so it falls into the category of anti-ship ballistic missiles. But this is almost cruise missile range by today's standards, 200 nautical miles. And has a very high terminal speed of Mach 8 or 9, so it is a hypersonic weapon. Absolutely. So India surprisingly on this list of uh, being one of the few countries with working anti-ship ballistic missiles. Really good article and a pretty cool picture there too. What do you guys think of this? I think this is a game changer. I think this really changes how we approach naval warfare whenever, because a lot of these weapons right now, and this will not stay this way, are land launched. So basically it's like pushing your fleets back away from shorelines. But once they get these on airplanes, like the Russians already have it for the uh, MiG-31, you know, then that's going to keep you even farther away. Or you figure out a way to defeat it so it's not as effective. But keep in mind, these, these weapons, even though they're ballistic, they're coming in at hypersonic speeds, even though I don't think this falls into the hypersonic weapon category. It might. It, it probably meets all the wickets for it. What do you guys think? Uh, let's see. Derp says it's not published yet. Spring 2022. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't want to spend a lot of time looking at that uh, web page, but I am going to pick that book up when it comes out. All right. So there you go. China, Russia, and India all have anti-ship ballistic missiles. Uh, I'm sure other countries are working on them, but there you go. And they are effective. That's why they're, it's important to learn about these because this is something that we have to take into account now. We have to now not just adjust for submarines, cruise missiles, nuclear missiles, there's there's a new weapon and it's an anti-ship ballistic missile. Apparently it works pretty good. All right. Our last news story for the day comes from H, uh, a, I'm sorry, USNI News, written by Mr. Uh, Zirhan Maha Dazir. Hope I didn't butcher that too bad. Sorry, sir. <laughs> he says U.S. and Japanese ships hold anti-submarine warfare drills in the South China Sea. And this is the this is kind of a big deal because that's the first time U.S. and Japan has done this uh, since World War II, I guess. But then we weren't doing it together. But um, so Japan is joining us. This looks like a Soryu class, but uh, the top is a little square. So I'm not 100 percent sure if it is Soryu. But if I refer to this as a Soryu, that's what I'm talking about. Anyway, from the piece, the author writes, uh, Kalawa Limpur, J Japanese and U.S. fleets meet this week in a first ever anti-submarine warfare exercise in the South China Sea. Uh, the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force said today, uh, helicopter destroyer J.S. Kaga and J.S. Uh, Murasami have embarked with the SH-60J helicopters and an unnamed, oh, it's a um, Yashio uh, submarine. It's not a, it's not a Soryu. Okay. So he's got the classification there, uh, with a P one maritime patrol and conduct, conducted an anti-submarine warfare exercise in South China Sea. That is really provocative because it's right off the coast of China, you know, and it's in waters that they claim. So, uh, this is, this is not a freedom of navigation exercise that I can justify, but if you start doing war games in other people's claimed, you know, terror, not territorial waters, but like, I guess it's their influence or economic zone or something. They're easy. 
when you start doing war games in someone else's EZ and they're not invited, no, that's 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 not good. That's definitely provocative. So this is the first time Japan submarine has conducted anti-submarine warfare exercise with the United States in this location. Uh, both the Kaga and the other ship that I can't say the name of have conducted exercise in the South China Sea with Millis last week and subsequently made a port call in the Philippines. Very cool. Very cool. So it'll be interesting to see what China's response to this, if they'll do any kind of protest or will they actually not respond? China tends to over respond to everything because it likes attention, it seems. But uh, I don't see anything in the story about China's response to this. This just happened. So I'm sure they'll come out with something. But here. Yeah. So the Soryu is much more round uh, than the uh, the old Oshu's, if I'm saying that name right. But yeah, it's got this this deck that is almost flat on top. And that's how you can tell the one way you can tell the difference. Yeah. All right. So it says the exercise focuses on the full spectrum of naval capabilities featuring cooperative evolutions that highlight the ability of the U.S. and Brunei to work together. So Brunei got in on this, too. Brunei is one of those big islands uh, kind of southwest of the Philippines there. So I guess they're they're taking part. In this as well. It says, meanwhile, over in Manila, a Russian naval corvette, 33 or 3337, 337 rather. <laughs> okay, and, uh, and a tanker and a tugboat, all these guys uh, were in port on November 16th. So the Russians are in the area too, uh, visiting the Philippines, it looks like, doing some replenishment. Anyway, cool picture of a sub right there. Yeah, what, what, are, what do you guys... Oh, is it Japan's easy too? Does Japan claim part of the South China Sea? Because that is a long ways away from Japan. But maybe they do. I don't know. You know, I'm learning more about China and their claims. I don't know the other countries. Apricot says, the U.S. can claim they are searching for Sonar Dome. That's true. Someone's got to find that thing. It's not... You'd be surprised. It's not that high tech. But we also don't want to just be handing that over to another country. Vulcan Rider says, uh, did you not get the story I sent you about the woman who was convicted for falsifying uh, strength test? Yes, I got that story from you and everybody else on the Internet. And we covered that story last Tuesday. I think it was like a week ago. Yeah, but thank you. I did. I did get that story. Yeah, that was the previous naval news. Zebra says, sorry for the OT after viewing your Delta last weekend. Um, he asks, I wondered what is the purpose of equipment can of equipping rather conventional warheads on an SLBM in wartime. If I see missiles getting popped out of the white sea, I'd automatically assume that it's a nuclear equipped, right? So part of that is to add confusion or doubt. So just because you see a ballistic missile launch, especially today, um, there's a 50, 50 chance it doesn't have a nuclear weapon on it. It could have an anti-ship ballistic missile warhead on it. It could have uh, kinetic energy rounds, the rods from gods, if you will. Uh, it could also have conventional warheads, like the Delta IV has this enormous 2,000-pound bomb that is a deep penetrator. Uh, comes from space because it's ballistic, and uh, it comes down like a meteor. It's designed to kill things that are hidden under mountains, like bunkers, and de really deep bunkers. So it penetrates with all that kinetic force you know, of a ballistic missile. And after it gets done penetrating, it then explodes a 2000 pound warhead as to whatever's down there. Yeah. A bunker buster. Yeah. But I understand. Uh, yeah. You're like, why, why don't they just put nukes on everything? Because I think the real answer is even in the next war, people are going to be very hesitant to pull that nuclear trigger, which is great. That's good news for everybody. Um, but it also causes confusion in your opponent if you begin launching ballistic missiles that don't have nuclear warheads and you could uh, cause your opponent to over escalate. So let's say one person used ballistic missiles conventionally, but was responded to with nuclear weapons and then they did a ceasefire. Well, guess who the bad guy is in the world opinion is going to be whoever used nuclear weapons, regardless of what the country it doesn't matter. Whoever uses nuclear weapons is going to be ostracized in the global community. So if you can provoke your opponent into overreacting like that, um, that, that might be another reason why they would, why they would use that weapon. 
yeah, it's all crazy. Like warfare is madness. So whenever I talk about these ideas, just understand that it's absolute insanity. And uh, I'm just throwing ideas out there. Vulcan Rider says orbital kinetic strike. Yeah, kinetic strikes are science fiction trope, and we have similar effects as a nuke. Yeah, see, that's the nice thing about the uh, the rods uh, that we well, did we talk about those? I mean, we we've, we've got them. I think it's probably information that everybody knows. America has the rods, tungsten rods that we can drop. I'm told they changed the material. It's not tungsten anymore, but it used to be tungsten. Uh, but you can do that and get the effect, the devastation of a nuclear weapon without all the radiation and fallout. And that's a big part of why you would not want to use nuclear weapons is, yeah, after you blow up all the things, you still can't use anything because it's all radioactive. But if you use the rods, you get similar effects without all the uh, aftermath. HT1 says now that the U.S. is getting a new frigate, I don't understand why the Navy doesn't arm it with a Tomahawk missile system. I think they are going to have VLS. We had that story a week ago where they're going to have, I think it's 28. No, it's 16, 16 VLS. Yeah. I think it's like 16 VLS with another 12 anti-ship uh, naval strike missiles on it, but they will have a, a VLS. And now if they have VLS, that implies that they could have Tomahawks. Uh, it doesn't mean that they will, but you know, who knows? All right. Well, that's it for the Naval news today. I appreciate you guys for watching and uh, we'll be right back with some more battle tech. All right. Don't go anywhere. Bye -bye. I say, don't go anywhere. And then I say, bye. What the hell? My brain, my brain's working against me.